Hi, everybody. I am Jordan Ostrop with Legalese Marketing, and this is Exhibit A Attorneys coming to you from our backup office, aka my house, because there's a uh, toddler with a fever in another room. So Molly has been nice enough to accommodate all of my tech issues today with this transfer. I am on a phone in a bedroom. We were, we are making this work. It is the ultimate 2021 go-to <laughs> show. So Exhibit A Attorneys, we interview attorneys and other experts across the country. To, take, to learn what it truly takes to be the Exhibit A of a successful attorney. Today, I have an awesome guest, Molly McGrath. Molly's going to talk to us about seven ways to empower your employees, which I think is a wonderful thing that we often skip on this show is that we usually talk from the owner's perspective, but ultimately all of us are a team. I think nobody embodies that knowledge better than Molly, so we are lucky enough to have her here to talk to us about it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Jordan, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So for anybody who somehow doesn't know you yet, what what's a what's a brief bio? Yeah, so my company is Hiring and Empowering Solutions. I have been staffing and consulting in the legal space for the past um, almost 26 years now. And I really like to focus on what I call entrepreneurs in the entrepreneur's world. I podcast every Tuesday. I've been blogging every single week since 2008. I haven't missed a week in regards to all tips, tricks, and um, strategies to support attorneys with empowering their employees to step up and lead to 26 years yep so i'm imagining molly at like 10 years old starting this company and everybody <laughs> just being like, oh i'll take it all day long thank you <laughs> and you have a podcast as well correct i do hiring and empowering solutions and i podcast every tuesday and for the most part i know you all are talking about really that finding employees retaining employees making better employees. I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful niche that you have because I don't see that in the legal industry nearly as much. Yeah, I'm very passionate about it. You know, it really starts with the questions that I get all the time from entrepreneurs and attorneys of how do I get my employees to step up and lead? And right now in 2020, the um, market is so volatile in the legal space. The unemployment rate is on, I, I mean, it's under 1% with attorneys and paralegals and legal professionals as well. And it is really, really hard to find people first and foremost, to find people that have the mindset, the skill set, the knowledge, and what have you. It's a very, very competitive market. So I'm really, really trying to work with law firms to tell them, you have to do everything you can to keep your employees happy because it is shark infested waters with recruiters just trying to poach everybody's employees. It's insanity. Yeah, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Absolutely. So we're going to get into some of those ways to empower employees and obviously retain the best employees, make them into better employees, et cetera. Uh, before that, I want to talk about our previous episode that aired on Monday. We were thankful to have Kristen Tyler from Law Clerk who walked us through a number of ways to delegate, especially when it comes to the legal work, obviously with Law Clerk providing an awesome platform for attorneys to help other attorneys in their expertise with a uh, written work of the attorney experts. So with that though, I wanna dive right in because this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. You know, having employees on multiple businesses and really trying, trying to be a great boss. And as much as I say that in an altruistic measure, obviously the business, businesses get impacted drastically by employee unhappiness and employee turnover. So obviously it's not 100% altruistic because it provides a much better experience for the company, the other employees, and obviously clients when you don't have rampant turnover. So what are we talking about when we're talking about empowering employees? You know, number one, I think it's uh, you have to remember that you are hiring human beings versus human doings. People lead is based on um, they don't get enough time, attention, and feedback. So number one, I would say pour into your employees invest in personal and professional development for them. I have a team empowerment academy that um, many of my law firms put their employees into. Investing in coaching is a way for you to be very competitive in the market. I do hiring for a lot of law firms and i.e. recruiting sales. I get to sell your law firm. There's so many people when I say 
belong to an organization, coaching, professional development, personal development, etc. Then that's a great way for me to get people to even look at. Me. Yeah, and it's interesting because I have always found. You know, it's like you want to grow your business, grow yourself from that personal development. But then as you move out into having a team of five, a team of 10 more, the more that everybody is working on that personal growth, you have exponential growth to the company, both in numbers and knowledge and usually revenue and client experience. I mean, it just it snowballs in a good way. And retention. I mean, people will not leave you if they are able to grow. If they are always able to have an environment, so often people will call, I'll call them, or they'll call me. I'm like, why are you looking for a new opportunity? Why are you looking for a new job? And they'll say, well, there's no growth here. There's no opportunity. And I really nail them down to give me a definition of that. When they peel away all the layers of it, it's that they're not connected. They don't know what true north is within the firm. They don't know how they play into it. And they really, as I can say over and over again, it's so simple as giving them time, attention, and feedback consistently. Not at quarterly reviews, not at annual reviews, not when their head's on the top of the block because they're not meeting their KPIs consistently. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because, I mean, I imagine, I imagine other industries see this, but from the legal industry, you know, it's it's how do you have that growth that isn't necessarily them going to law school. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the lawyers I've talked to have had staff members go on to become attorneys. Some of them have even come back to the firm as an attorney. But for the most part, the majority of our employees, we're talking about how to find that growth where they, I don't want to say stay, but where they where they don't go to law school. You know, they become a paralegal, they become an office manager, they become a director of operations, they become, you know, something along those lines. Is that what you're talking about a lot when it comes to this room for growth? Absolutely. There's always, you know, my favorite positions are the ones that start as a receptionist or start as a secretary or what have you. And, you know, my second point of the seven tips of how to get people to really stay and maintain and to empower your employees and build leadership is that you have their top three revenue producing activities that they do. Like, what? What does a receptionist produce? At revenue. They absolutely do because they are your sales force. They are your director of first impressions. So when they have KPIs attached to that, and then they move up into maybe an intake coordinator, or maybe they're moving up to every position. I always tell people when you're replacing someone, your job is always to replace yourself within your position. So number two is make sure they have their top three KPIs or key performance indicators that they do that atta directly attach to number one, conversion rates, revenue, the client experience, and things of that nature. And once they master that, there's always an opportunity for a you know, marketing. Number one, the marketing Sorry, you cut out a little bit for me at the end there. But you, you were talking about the three KPIs for the position and then potentially as they move up, still tracking some of those or changing those KPIs? Absolutely. Not only are they tracking and changing them, but also they're creating the SOPs to make the train and onboard the replacement. Yeah, so standard operating procedures for anybody who's not following or <laughs> policies and procedures or the million different things, how, how to do things, if you will. Um, and so that's such an interesting point because I, you know, it's we always struggle with KPIs from the law firm perspective. And I think it's really interesting to have the, you know, tie it to those revenue producing ones limit yourself to, you know, those three major ones. So you're not tracking yourself into inaction and you're also giving them guidance on what's expected of their position. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, I think it's so, that's such an, I don't want to say simple, but like simple in a good way, you know, because I think a lot of people at a, at a law firm, you know, you end up having two or three employees that are sort of jacks of all trades or Jill's of all trades as well. And then it's really hard for them to figure out their priorities. Whereas if you focus it into, you know, these are the things that you're going to be measured on, it makes it much easier for them to make decisions on what to do. Yeah. And when you start people, when you're onboarding them from the place of what their top three produce revenue producing or uh, 
file producing activities are and you declare them and then you meet every single week on them and you take one small step at a time in the right direction, then you can discern when it's time to shift roles, when it's time to hire another person, things of that nature. But that's what happens so often. We hire someone, we're so excited with about them. We throw everything in the kitchen sink at them and we give them no time. We give them no onboarding. We give them very little feedback. And then at the end of the day, I get the phone call saying, they're not working out. They're not a good fit for the firm. And to your point, the average person in a small, solo, medium sized law firm is wearing 3.4 hats. And jobs that each one of them are delivering at any given time, including the entrepreneur. When I typically start working with them, yeah, I, w I honestly would have guessed it was higher. So that's <laughs> as as terrible as it is, that's better than I expected. I remember, you know, I remember day one of running a firm. You're you're the HR department. You're the billing department. You're the fulfillment department. You're the sales department. You're the marketing department. You're doing payroll. You're scouting out office space. You're signing the leases for rent. You're you're putting together, hopefully, the policies and procedures for other people to take things off your plate. Um, you know, it's just it's amazing how many different hats that we can wear, uh, as well as actually being lawyers and doing legal work. Yeah, it, it it's so often. I, I'll give one quick tip that I'll give to everybody listening, whether you're an employee, a manager, or you're the entrepreneur, in a way to see how many hats people actually are, are wearing and where you really need to get clarity on roles and goals. Take out an old school yellow legal pad and start tracking everything you touch for one week. And there's something to be said about putting pen to paper. There's so many psychology and sciences attached to that. Write Monday at the top of it and write down everything you touch and do it all the way through Friday. Have everybody in the firm do it and give yourself the gift and grace of scheduling out a full day retreat where you lit you sit down and you map it all out and whiteboard it. And you will very clearly see where there are so many people that are touching multiple things more than once yeah it was, it was interesting because recently i finally bit the bullet and got myself a, a full-time dedicated personal assistant as opposed to sort of a part-time or a half this half something else position and you know a lot of people that i talked to were like well that's kind of you know like why why do you feel you needed that or you know what are some of the roles and i was like i made a list and there's all these things you know there's the there's doing the workers comp audit and they're signing off on this and there's making sure that we paid the, uh, the taxes for this and there's running this thing. I mean, it's not even, you know, it's not even like having them go pick up dry cleaning because I always wear this anyway, but there's <laughs> just so many of those little small things that I didn't want to do. And apparently that, you know, we turned that into a full-time job. Yeah, they should always be saving you money, making you money and absolutely freeing you up so you can work on higher producing activities. Makes perfect sense. All right. So what is our third tip? Yes, this is my favorite. And this is the one I get the greatest pushback from. Make certain that you have a dedicated weekly, what I call a stakeholders meeting, not a team meeting, not an employee meeting. Every single person that you hire should be have the mindset and the, the drive to be consider themselves as a stakeholder. In that meeting, it's one hour. You treat it like a stand-up military meeting that is facilitated with an agenda. And I'm happy to give any of your listeners a copy of any tools I mentioned today for free. And it's facilitated, ideally not by an attorney, ideally not by an entrepreneur. And this is an opportunity for everybody to declare and clarify and verify their top three for the week. Get really clear so they can plan their work and work their plan. And another really drive-by tip that I can give you, make sure you kick off with, again, the personal and professional development and the recognition. Start off with wins, personal and professional, and then each person in the company goes through and has a personal and professional win as well as a thank you. Somebody they want to acknowledge for supporting them in their growth. I don't know. Uh, Breezy, are you nodding your head as per our uh, Monday meetings? Does it sound a little familiar? <laughs> So, uh, and for those of you that don't see, we have a third producer, Breezy, who really has the hardest job when it comes to this. He's going through, swapping all the screens over, bringing up your comments, et cetera. So it leaves, uh, leaves me with definitely the easiest job. So um, is there, I know you had mentioned providing some resources. Is there a website page or something people can go to to get, uh, I guess it's a sample agenda of this or it's a checklist for a meeting like this or something? 
yeah, all you have to do is go to hiringandempowering.com. Anything I mentioned today or anything that triggers something to say, hey, do you have a tool for this? I'm pretty certain after 20, almost 26 years of doing this, I'll have a tool for it. Go to my contact page and just fill it out. Tell me you were, you were on Jordan's show and let me know what you want. And I'll send you all a Google Drive for any tools that we mentioned today. Fantastic. You want to talk about being able to go down an awesome rabbit hole, the amount of content value and resources that molly has you will uh you will be overwhelmed but you will be so much more successful implementing even just the uh the iceberg of them <laughs> all right so what do we have coming up on number four of our ways to empower our employees number four is to have a daily huddle treat it like a, a locker room huddle before you're going on this super bowl playing field it doesn't have to be you as a managing attorney but somebody as the department head where you are meeting at the beginning of the day or the end of the day whatever time fits for your team especially if you have independent contractors outsourcers what have you where everybody is hopping on a zoom very quickly and declaring what their top priorities are for the day i can't tell you how many times i will get emails and phone calls and texts and facebook messages from people like just so furious about all the deadlines that are missed. You can have Clio, you can have all these practice management softwares and Trello boards and what have you, but it's so often just investing 15 minutes of getting crystal clear. When you are clear, concise, and you are over communicating as a team, it's amazing how much there's no dropping of balls. There's no emergencies there's no putting out fires and that energy that we always with. so very clearly this is a way to eliminate any crisis and this is the one i'm not even going to push back on you because you are a hundred percent correct this is the one that is like my seventh circle of hell like a we a date a weekly meeting i totally get we outline everything we go over it we're on the same page we talk about the weekend do an icebreaker the daily stuff is just my, like, this should have been an email, but, but I say that knowing you are totally correct. That is exactly the experience to everyone I've talked to who has done the daily ones is that they get the, all the deadlines start getting met. Things start getting done faster. People start getting bought in. So I am just a reluctant uh, supporter of it. I don't know. I don't even know how to phrase it because you are right. I just hate it. Yeah, you you have a love-hate relationship with it, but I'll tell you, I hate email more than I hate this. Email creates such a communication being pong, and everybody, there's always three sides of this story. What you said, what she said, and what was actually intended. And email, in my experience, creates such a, you know, you send something out and somebody sends you back with, I'm confused because so-and-so said this, and then next thing you know, you have 14 emails going back for, and in my experience, I'm like, I'm out. I'm sick of responding to all these emails. And then the employee does nothing because they're like, well, you didn't give me clear direction. So it's such a way. Can I, I don't know about you, but for me, it takes 15 minutes to write one email and respond to it. Because very rarely, you know, do people, are people clear and concise in their email? They write a dissertation. And if I can't get past paragraph one, I stop reading it. Yeah. And it's, and it's funny because like, so my internal lawyer loves text message or email or messaging because it's like having your court reporter, right? Like I said this, they said this, but you are totally correct that there is so much of those like context or people mean things differently or the connotation versus the denotation that like, I mean, we, I, I've got clients in on the law firm and the marketing company where I'm like, we can't talk by email. You know, you seem like a jerk or we're not on the same page, but we get on the phone and we're like, you know, the best of buds that have been known each other for decades because yeah. it's just that that different conversation or the immediacy of the response or the ability to follow up, um, you are, again, you are totally correct. I just, that is my, my cross to bear that I bear over and over again because it is so effective, but I hate it. Yeah, yeah. It's it, once you get in the habit of it, it's so efficient because there's something to be said. People can hide out behind technology. To your point, I'll get emails from uh, attorneys and my staff are like, "Oh my gosh, they're the biggest jerk." What have you? I'm like, "No, no, no. 
let's get them on the phone. And they're like, they are not the same communicator on email that they are on phone because people hide out behind technology, number one. And then number two, depending on people's Colby's and the way their mind's wired, if they're very literal and they're a fact finder, when you hop on a Zoom every single day, you got I got to look you in the eyeballs and I have to answer really clear. Did you do this? Yes or no. I don't want this story of why you did or did it or why you were waiting for so and so. I need a clear answer. So when you can facilitate it, and that's the key to it, you have a daily huddle, but somebody who knows how to facilitate, stop the story, stop the drama, stop the excuses and get a clear yes or no. And if not, when is it going to get turned around and done? Yeah. And the you come back to that facilitation word, but that is so true. Like, Running a meeting is a genuine skill and it is often worth its weight in gold. Um, I know I can tell you, I definitely sat there at other meetings where like, I could do a better job. And then the minute I led a meeting, at least my first, gosh, I don't <laughs> even know, my first hundred or so, I was like, maybe I can't run a better meeting than that okay. person. They make, they make a valid point. <laughs> so we'll see if Breezy nods his head on that one. Although I don't usually run the meetings. So <laughs> he's like, no, we don't no, let him. <laughs> we're good. All right. Uh, number five. Number five, quarterly strategic retreats. I cannot say enough about this, where you go off campus, and it's a little trickier during this time right now, but you can do it in a Zoom meeting. I've been facilitating them all through 2020 up until today, where you get in a Zoom room meeting. Again, you have somebody who's facilitating it, where you're really clear. I, I have my law firms focus on four power projects, not much more than that. Most people have the company and friend might be three the next thing you know we come up with 15 projects well we don't have any infrastructure for we don't have any for no more than four projects and how is everybody coming to this are department heads coming to this like how do you decide who's at this quarterly retreat or not everybody everybody okay well, maybe, not your maybe not your independent contractors that are just contracted paper pushes what have you but people that are responsible for things. and how long of a retreat is this one day one full day no email no uh, computers no working on active files things of the nature which is a big picture where are we going? What are the four things that we can implement within the firm? I love that. So we've got our we've got our weekly meeting with one purpose. We've got our daily huddles, and now we've got this quarterly overall ten thousand foot. You know, going up to the going up to the balcony to see everything big picture. I love it. Let me say something about that. You just triggered something for me. Sure. It's really important. Most times, people do these big strategic retreats. And then guess what? They do them every year. They don't do anything with it. They don't ever talk about it. Everyone's all pumped up and they're excited or they're deflated because they know you always make them suffer and sit through these things and we never do anything with it. So the key is to have somebody facilitating it. Again, not the entrepreneur or the attorney, somebody walking out very clearly with the four strategic power projects. And again, I'll give you my process for that. And then you you review it every week in your weekly stakeholders meeting. 15 minutes. Okay, here's where we're at. And you make certain that you have a bonus or incentive comp attached to that that is team-centric. Because if you're reviewing it every week and you're very clear on what needs to occur to reach our bonus, and then you have at the end of the quarter where you're reviewing it and taking an extra 30 minutes in your last meeting during your stakeholders meeting, I've never met a firm that hasn't crushed it with that, with that structure. Yeah, I mean, I was easily three and a half years of employee evaluations that never built on each other, that we never followed up with the stuff we talked about, that we, you know, changed gears so much. Um, and it was terrible. So you, again, I, I have, I have walked this walk. You are totally right in this one as well. <laughs> but this one, I will tell you, I do not hate. This is something I do love. I love that big picture. Make sure everybody is realigned or still aligned or pivoting together, especially during COVID. The things that we've seen some firms be able to do over the last 12 months because of, you know, having a team lined up has been the difference between success and failure, like flat out. Absolutely. And typically it's that you love a big picture because you're an entrepreneur, you're an innovator, what have you, but employees despise it because usually 
you're, it's when you're running, you know, in between meeting for another cup of coffee where you're like, hey, implement blah, 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 and it's drive by bomb getting that. And that's why this strategic meeting is so great. It's for you, so for the employee, to have a plan. You know what? I think you just answered that better than I have ever been able to come up with it. Because I, I do think that a lot of my employees love those daily meetings a lot more. And that is the, I, like, I am, my wife will tell you she is my rock for so many reasons. But one, because she stops me from floating away with the big picture <laughs> stuff. So uh, thank you for the insight, because that is dead on. Yeah. Ah, well, welcome. Hi, good to see you. I can't see you, but thank you. She's, she's on <laughs> Facebook Live. And Kristen was nice enough to connect me with some other potential future guests. So I really appreciate her uh, time and effort there as well as her insight on the show. Yes, she has been on my list. So Kristen, reach out to me. I'd love to have you on my podcast. Hey, there we go. All right, I will do a, an email okay. intro to make sure that we get that done. Awesome. All right, so number six. You mentioned it already. I just did a whole training program on that. You said employee reviews. I did a whole workshop on why the employee review must die. Oh, and for uh -oh. the exact reason of why you said it, it's just the naming convention of it and the mindset around it. The boss hates it because they're like, do I give them a raise? Am I giving them discretionary bonus? What are the standards around if they get it, if they don't? The employee hates it because it feels like their head's on the chopping block. So the whole thing about a performance review, I've really revamped this whole thing to have as an employee growth plan and really have it just even shifting that they're doing some two millimeter shifts around the mindset, the intentionality of it. And I have a whole process. Again, I'd be happy to give. And where it is that, from day one when they start and if you have existing employees go back and start doing it quarterly and within my review the employee does an evaluation then the entrepreneur not just of himself but the company with the resources that you have available for them then the entrepreneur that the review will come together and you treat it like a coaching session not a review, a coaching session, a leadership session. And out of there, you walk out with top three goals. Again, then you're, they're always anchoring to that in their daily huddle. And then before you leave that meeting, you schedule their next quarterly one. And they're very, very clear and concise. You both clarify and verify on what the different goals are that they're going to accomplish. And it's anchored in growth versus review. I love that. The minute you started that off and I was like, I had this fear in the pit of my stomach, like, oh my God, but you got me on board. That is because, because it's so true. Like at the end of the day, I hate managing. I definitely hate micromanaging, but I do love that. Like, let's get on the same side of the table for the growth of you, the growth of the firm, the growth of, you know, whatever it is along those lines. And so that employee growth plan, I do think that is exactly what I've always wanted out of an employee evaluation, just phrased and framed the right way. Yeah. And the employees love it. They look forward to it. You know, what's so the best part about that is there's some questions in um, the review. I can't remember off the top of my head, but like what resources don't you have available for you? If, if you were the boss, how would you set up your, your daily life for success? When I get these reviews, because some of my firms will send them to me, I get pages and pages from employees, but it's not complaining and it's not throwing other people under the bus. There are usually traditionally amazing ideas in that. Then the flip side of that is when you get one word answers from other employees and they say nothing and you're like, okay, now you know the difference between an employee mindset and an entrepreneur mindset. You also know when you're getting one word answers or you're not getting a tremendous amount of feedback that they're pouring their heart and their soul into this, then it's reflection to you as an entrepreneur, as a boss to be like, okay, 
do I really have a safe environment to get these the real truth and feedback from my employees? Because when you don't get a ton of information and them just pouring into their giving you ideas and insights and what they see as the future of the firm, then you have to look at yourself that you really haven't created a safe environment for true feedback and for people to speak their truth in an honest, well, respectful, empowering way. Yeah, the the all time best feedback or idea that I ever got was one of my one of my receptionists who left us for a much better law school than I went to was like, hey, can we get a stamp with our name on a, an address on it? Because I'm <laughs> sending out this mail. We're filling out these forms at the doctor's office. We're going through that. And like I'm writing the address on, on paper like 20 times a day. We're like, absolutely. So like for eight bucks, we order this stamp with ink. And then we found out like it was saving her 45 seconds per time times 20 per day times whatever it was like at the end of this, you know, she saved herself like three weeks of work over the course of the rest of the time she was there over something that would have never occurred to me because I'm not filling out those forms. And she did it in such a great like ownership manner of this is my task, you know, help me be as effective as possible. And it was great. Oh my, Jordan, that is seriously, on the reviews, it's things of that nature. Can we get a new printer? Because the one that we have is such a dinosaur and it's taking me 45 minutes to print an estate plan. And the attorney's like, what? That should be taking you 10 minutes, of course. But without these reviews, employees don't have the things that they need. And we can have awareness around the inefficiencies within our office. Yeah. Well, and I think you also then have to, I think you then also have to share with the team like, oh, you know, we had this idea we've implemented, this is the success it's had. Cause then I think you, you breed more people and you snowball it into others having similar guidance and feedback and suggestions about their job. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And so last but not least, number seven. All right. This one, <laughs> it sounds so simple, but so many law firms fail at this. You need to put standard in a framework within your business for celebration and fun. Right? We are horrible as entrepreneurs and especially as law firms where it's all about the billable hour. It's all about the KPI. It's all about the life cycle of the file. It's all about production to remember, again, that you're employing human beings and there has to be recognition. There has to be appreciation. There has to be a celebration. I can't tell you how many law firms will call me and they'll share with me where they're at. I'm like, that's phenomenal. You're doing that. What do you do as a team to celebrate that? And they don't have that. So even if you put in your wire in and you framework, they have some kind of team building in your team where you're meeting every other week for happy hour, or you're having a lunch where you're bringing in a catered lunch. We have firms that they're doing, you know, weekly yoga classes, things of that nature, but somewhere you have to make certain you have in your structure, whatever works for you. So if you're stressed out and busy and you don't have enough time, do it monthly, do it bowling, do it what have you. Things are starting to open up now. People are getting so creative on Zoom. If you're all virtual, bringing in a motivational speaker, bringing in you know, a tech or whatever it might be, but you have to have some level of celebration and team from build team building because again, it's a retention tool, it's a celebration tool, and it's a reflection tool, and it's a way to keep your team connected. It's all about creating the culture. And please, dear God, or dear gosh, however you want me to phrase it, when in doubt, ask people what they want. Like, what would you like to see? You know, do you like, do you want us to bring in food? Do you want to go to the movies? Do you want to go to Top Golf? Whatever. You will probably never get a consensus, but you'd be so surprised, at least for me, I was so surprised how few people are like, I just want money. You know, people want the event. They want the experience. They want that togetherness. And so, you know, if you're sitting here for, doing an employee of the month bonus, potentially your employees would prefer to go to lunch with you and, you know, yeah. and spend that time or, you know, or, you know, or be able to have, or take an extra half an hour off, you know, get a free extra longer or slightly longer Friday, something along those lines. So when in doubt, ask people about the rewards that they want or the team building activities that they want yeah. to do. I love that. That's a great way, whether you're doing a bonus structure an incentive comp or team building activities, 
you don't put all the pressure on you because typically what you present is not what's going to really excite them. Speak into people's listening in a way that makes a difference for them. Have them create it. And all of you whiteboard, to Jordan's point, you're never going to get 100%, but you can uh, overall come up with a general thing. Money, time, retreats, whatever it might be, uh, by and large, it's typically a combination between your time so they can you know have a beer with you or would have you pick your brain about how you grew your business and they get to connect with you as a human and money so you get a company yeah and you know for anybody worried about covid i totally understand that part but or and, and there's um there's apps there's like evil apples which is apples for apples through your iphone or and i think there's an android so everybody could log in on zoom you could play the game through the internet, everybody can still be remote. Um, there's Jackbox, game, Jackbox Games, which has all sorts of games that you can play all through the phone. So you log everybody in a Google Meet or Zoom. You have everybody play on their phones for the thing. So you don't have to be in the same place, but you're still playing the same game. Whether it's trivia, whether it's apples to apples, whether it's um, the one of them's like a knockoff Boulder Dash where you come up with lies and you guess like who made what lie and stuff. So there are all sorts of ways to do this remotely, but still feel together. Yeah, we had a firm that actually did, um, brought in one of those painters, wine, sip and wine painters, and they did it all in Zoom and had a blast. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really fun because they picked the core values. So their words of what they have, like empowered team, you know, client first, and they made it in regards to that so they could each hang it in there. Interesting. I may steal that idea. We have our, uh, for the law firm, I think we have about the same number of core values as we have people. <laughs> Actually, let me rephrase that. Let me make sure that that's something they would be interested in before we do that as the- uh, There you go. So as we get towards the end here, I mean, any, I, I'm sure, look, you've been doing this long enough. You've helped enough law firms. You could give us insight for hours, but any other just big, quick tips that we want to make sure that we cover? Yeah. You know, what I would say in parting, especially in this time that we're in right now in 2020 and how tight the legal space is, I really want to encourage the lawyers to really shift your mindset about, you know, your position that you have, your culture that you have in the firm. You have to know that if you give your time, attention, feedback, you give them a culture of growth, you give them a culture uh, where their voice matters, they will not leave you, but you really have to shift your mindset around, you know, that they are lucky to have a job. Those days are over. They are constantly interviewing their position day because I don't mean to be fear, losing fear, but if you're, you're they're out there and exposed anywhere, there's recruiters that are going to be hunting them. And so you want to make sure that you are always creating the culture and implement these seven tips so people want to find you. Yeah, I mean, the the best reflection of an awesome culture is an employee turning down a job offer somewhere else for more money because they feel heard here, because they love who they work with, because they're treated well, because of, you know, a million different reasons that people like that stability. But at the end of the day, that's a very intentional decision by whomever's in charge, attorney, uh, office manager, whatever, to facilitate an environment that people want to stay connected to. I know, you know, when my recruiters will send out emails, this is the subject line. Are you happy and are you treated well? I can't tell you how many, I would say 80% of the attorneys, paralegals, what have you, will reply back and say, not interested in even talking to us. And I will literally see what firms are working at and send the managing attorney an email. Great job. Great job on keeping up your your people don't even talk to us. That's awesome. That is, that would be an email to be very excited to get. Like, hey, I tried to poach your employees and they told me to go pound sand. Yeah. So keep going. Yeah. That's great. All right. So um, our next, next week's going to be a little bit different. We, um, on Monday, we're not going to have a guest. Monday, we are going to be sharing our running a referral-based practice worksheet and slideshow. 
Um, you'll have access to that on the video, and then you'll be able to sign up to get a copy of the slides as well. We had those professionally done. So the version that I made a long time ago now looks so much better by somebody who really knows how to use uh, Canva, Photoshop, whatever was used. And then on um, Wednesday of next week, we'll have Allison Williams talking about how to crush chaos in your law firm. So Monday, no guest referral uh, slide sheet, how to run referral based practice. Thursday, Allison Williams will be joining us. But I'm not going to let Molly go without two things. Um, one, because I can't see the feed, I just want to make sure we have all the right contact information and that there's nothing else that Molly you want us to share. So Breezy, can you let us know what's in there in the comments, please? That's great. Thank you very much. Can you pull a copy of um, a link to her podcast? I just there Molly's podcast and I, you're here. I'll say it to you. I'd say it behind your back as well. It's just great. Like there is not that same dedicated podcast from the employee perspective, from the talent acquisition, retention, whatever. And so I think that is one that a lot of law firm owners glass, glaze over and then come back wondering why have I wasted so much time and spent so much money bringing in new people, rotating out bad hires, et cetera. So please make sure we have our podcast on here. So with that being said, we're going to end this show the way we end every episode. If somebody has been listening for the last about 40 minutes and takes nothing else away, remembers absolutely none of the great wisdom that you have shared, what is your biggest piece of advice on how to be the exhibit A of a successful attorney? I would say the biggest piece of advice if you implement only one tool out of the seven that we give to you is having a weekly stakeholders meeting. Invest one hour a week as an overall company to pour into your employees and to infuse your core values and your cultures and get clarity and get unity. That alone is a single handed tool that I think keeps happy employees and keeps successful law firms. Yeah, that was um, that was something that we brought in. Well, I mean, we changed how we were doing it during COVID. And now even with some of the people being back, we haven't gone back because it works so well. Um, I'm a huge fan of that. You know, once a week, we do it at the beginning of the week on uh, at nine o'clock for one business at, ten, at 1030 for, excuse me, legal ease. Um, and it's just it's been great to really realign everybody every week, get everybody on the same page share, you know, quick issues, share thanks and gratitude with everybody. Um, it is, I, I have started to look forward to it more and more every week, especially during everything that's been going on for now the last, you know, 13 months. Yeah, I'll tell you just quickly, you know, Jordan, when I get law firm owners call me and saying, I can't close in the tank. I don't know what happened. Our leads are down. My number one question is, are you having your weekly meeting someplace sometime each week? And they're like, no, nah, we abandoned that. We got too busy. Nah, because of COVID, we have, that is the single, single defining factor of why your money, your capital, your conversions, your leads, your production are in the tank. We abandoned that one single tool. Yeah, it's, it's always amazing to me that I often find people will cut out or cut back on the reasons for success and then wonder why they're no longer successful. Yes. Yeah. Well said. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. Um, thank you for listening to this episode of Exhibit A Attorneys. If you're interested in becoming the Exhibit A of successful attorney, please check us out at LegalEaseMarketing.com, E-A-S-E.